My name is Rich Lorenzo, and I'm with Called to Greatness. And on behalf of Called to Greatness, we want to thank you guys for coming tonight to, Lawrence, to, the, to our Lawrence School Board Forum. Um, tonight, we have 10 of the 12 candidates running um, for part participating tonight, 10 of the 12 candidates. And so thank you, candidates. We give them a round of applause for showing up. You know, we, ap we appreciate you get giving voters the opportunity to discover more about you, uh, your views, and values. Um, so, thank you. Before we get started, um, I want to highlight a couple things. One, I want to thank Morningstar Church for hosting the event. Um, secondly, water and mints in the back, very important items. If, you're, if you need that, they're right behind you there on back, back right, or sorry, st back stage right. Um, also, we're recording tonight's forum for those who are unable to attend. So if there's something you missed, you want to you catch it later, you can do that. Um, but without further ado, let's get started. Um, I would like to introduce our moderator for tonight, Mr. Ryan Hickman. Great. Thank you, Rich. I have never gotten clapped for just for reading questions, so that's exciting. Uh, hopefully all of you will be uh, receiving loud rounds of applause tonight as well. So first of all, I want to uh, go through uh, just kind of some of the rules uh, for the forum this evening. Um, uh, as you all know, the questions uh, were given to the candidates in advance uh, so that you would have an opportunity to prepare. Uh, in an effort to really hear from all of our candidates this evening, uh, we are going to limit our introductory comments to 90 seconds and our closing statements to one minute, uh, or 90 seconds as well. So 90 seconds start, 90 seconds finish, and the magic number, 90 seconds to respond to questions in between time. Um, there is, I wanted to mention, uh, Andrew Nussbaum uh, is unable to be here this evening. He had a family emergency come up in the last couple of hours, so he'll be unable to be here uh, with us this evening. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. And in order to get started, we're going to start off with uh, Melissa this evening and move this direction. And I'll be changing it up as we go, so I may, for a certain question, possibly start with Nate and then kind of move around, but we're all grown adults and we can figure out how that works, right? So, um, so Melissa, let's start with you. If you could introduce yourself and then we'll move down the row. Also want to point out that we are, uh, because we are doing audio this evening, it may be that before we move to the next person, uh, like if we're going from Marcus to Nate, I, I may say, okay, thank you, Marcus, Nate. And so I'm not repeating it just because you don't know who's next. It's for the people listening uh, through audio. And they're unable to see that from the video as well. So that's why I'm doing that. So um, we'll begin with uh, Melissa Clissold. And please introduce yourself and your statement, and then we'll move on down. Uh, my name's Melissa Clissold, and I am a mother, a wife, um, a daughter <laughs> of lots of roles. I am a previous paraeducator in the Lawrence Public School District. I was at Liberty Memorial Central two years ago as a paraeducator, and then I was at uh, Lawrence Free State High School, and I worked as a para in the autistic on the autism room. I'm also a cheer coach, which is my favorite part of being part of the <laughs> Lawrence Public Schools. I coached cheer at Liberty Memorial Central and during the pandemic, I also coached Billy Mills Middle School because they didn't have a coach. Um, so that being said, I am a cheer coach, so I have a loud voice, so giving me a microphone could be dangerous. If it appears I'm yelling at you, that is not intended. I just always speak in exclamation points. Closer. I was just really afraid I would be yelling because I have a really loud voice. So. And Melissa, you still have 30 seconds, and I forgot to repeat the second part. It's introducing yourself and why you are running for school board. Oh, I'm running for yeah. school board. So 
uh, as a cheer coach, I forgot about that. Um, as a cheer coach, I wanted to do a fundraiser because at Liberty Moral Central Middle School, uh, my students were having a hard time buying the need, stuff they needed to be a cheerleader, and well, such as shoes. And I wanted to do a fundraiser, and I was told I couldn't because that's board policy. And I found out that the high schools can do fundraisers, which I don't feel that's equity because my students are just as important as high schoolers. And so that I said, well, I guess I have to run for school board so I can do a fundraiser for my cheerleaders. In short, that's why I wanted to run, was just to make some changes towards equity. Great, thank you. Kay? All right. Hello, how's everyone doing today? Um, my name is uh, Kay Emerson. I, as you know, also I'm up here because I'm running for a school board, USD 497. I was late today because I actually had an opportunity to go and visit Bert Nash before I came here. Uh, it's just an opportunity to know what we are doing in regards to our mental health. As we know, uh, COVID-19 has really um, just made it really hard and more difficult for a lot of people. So I had that honor to, and Nate was there with me, um, able to go there. So I was a little late this uh, uh um, to this forum. Um, but yes, I'm running for school board. I've been here in Lawrence for about 20 years. Um, I have been doing so many things um, with uh, the school district. Uh, currently, uh, I'm sitting on the COVID-19 uh, committee in addition to, uh, I'm the chair of uh, Parents of Color um, Advisory Council. Uh, for me, you know, it wasn't all, it wasn't about like if I was gonna run for school board. It was always about when. And for me, when, you know, I believe that we all persons, regardless of your position, um, you know, has a right to equitable experiences. My goal is to, to eliminate those barriers that are keeping us from being able to achieve what we want. And then choice, it, my commitment really is to ensure that re regardless of how you show up, that you're going to be able to have that choice of mode, have that choice of classes, have that choice of just being able to school, explore and discover what you want in our public schools. So again, it wasn't really a matter of if, it was just a matter of when. And that when is now, and I'm so excited to be on this lovely stage with everyone today um, and to be here with you. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Malcolm. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Malcolm Proudfit. I'm on GR Gordon Ross's campaign committee, um, covering for him for just a short time, who, uh, while he rushes here from a prior engagement, and I've got his written statement here. Um, good evening, my name is GR Gordon Ross, and I'm running for re-election to the school board. I have lived in Lawrence for 25 years, and I'm married with five children. Three of these children have graduated from Lawrence High, the fourth will be a sophomore, and the fifth will be an eighth grader at Billy Mills. My wife works part-time as an assistant buyer at the KU Bookstore, and I work for a hospital in Montana as a clinical IT specialist. I am running for re-election because after four years on the board, I feel there is still good work left to do. In the last four years, we've been able to hire a tremendous superintendent create and implement a five-year strategic plan, work through parts of two bond issues that touched all of our buildings, and completely rethink how we go about negotiating with our unions. All of that work has been vital and rewarding, and it's just getting started. I want to be a part of where this district goes in the next four years, and I feel my experience and commitment to the process can continue to help us move forward and work to provide a quality education for all students. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Kelly? Good evening. I'm Kelly Jones, and I'm running for re-election. For the next three days, I'm the president of the school board, and then Erica Hill will be taking over from here, and she's more than prepared to do it. I'm excited that she'll be leading the board. Um, I have been a social worker for about uh, in social services for about 20 years. Um, Approximately 10 of them I've been licensed here in Kansas, and I've been in hundreds of Douglas County homes working with individuals who are experiencing crisis. And what I discovered in that work was that when people had access to to um, quality education or had had higher levels of educational attainment, they weathered those crises 
better. So we've all experienced a crisis in the last year, um, and that's my experience. And, and this was an opportunity serving on the board to be part of the solution that would get our kids to a place where they can weather life in a way that allows them to have a high quality. Um, I know that there are other people on this panel who have the kind of service experience that I do. I would imagine all 12 of us, it's in our DNA to serve the public. Um, so I'll tell you something that might be a little bit different about me, and I'll let my um, candidate colleagues tell me if I'm incorrect about this. I grew up in a bakery, so I got up as a small child at 4.30 in the morning, and I helped fill cases with donuts, and I come, I filled farmers' coffees with, you know, till they were filled to the brim, and then they'd come back with 10 cents, and I'd give them another cup. Um, I learned how to work hard, and that's the kind of work ethic that I bring to the board, and I hope to have an opportunity to run again. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus? Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Marcus Logan, and off and on, I've been a lifelong resident of lovely Lawrence, Kansas. I graduated from Lawrence High School, and I'm currently a business owner who raised two kids in the district, both graduates of Free State High School. I am a 2019 graduate of the Leadership Lawrence class from the Chamber of Commerce, and I currently sit on the Leadership Lawrence Advisory Board. I am currently a Human Relations Commissioner of Lawrence, and I'm a member of the Lawrence, Kansas Juneteenth Organization, where I currently serve as Vice President. I am also on the Select Committee as a member of the Human Relations Committee, as we um, erect plaques for Nick Rice and Tiger Dowdell. I am running for a seat because it will be a continuation of my own growth of leadership. And I think that as a lifelong resident of Lawrence, it's about time that I help with the community and the kids of our great city. Thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you. Nate? Hi, everyone. My name is Nate Morshus. I am president and co-founder of RPG on Mass Street. I'm also an elder at City Church Lawrence. I sit on two boards, uh, Trinity In-Home Care, as well as the Lawrence Restaurant Association. Um, I'm running because I have four children in the school system, two of which are adopted through foster care, one of which has special needs. And to be honest, it has been the experience um, with my daughter who has special needs where I got to see all the resources available in the public school system and it has become a major part of my life and I see what a resource it is and can be for our community. Um, I am a regular volunteer at uh, the College and Career Center and when uh, I've gotten to know Patrick Kelly County Commissioner um, who encouraged me to run because he saw my values at the College and Career Center working with the students. This has been a really important push for me because in, I have viewed uh, public service as part of my future, but when he, when he talked with me and encouraged me, I, uh, I was, uh, that's sort of what pushed it over the edge for me and uh, to decide that now is the time. It's been quite a year and uh, this is an important election. Thank you. Douglas. Hi, my name is Douglas Redding. I'm a school bus driver for first student. I've been there seven years. Uh, I was born in Lawrence, Kansas at Lawrence Memorial Hospital. And I've lived here 48 out of 53 years of my life. Um, ping pong back and forth um, between divorced parents in the United States. And I've traveled some and seen what other educational uh, opportunities there are. I decided to run because where I live, which is in southeast Lawrence, it seems that we are becoming more and more underrepresented. And uh, even though the future of Kennedy's Elementary School looks like it's a great opportunity with early childhood development care, that's great. What we are continually missing are neighborhood schools. And I think that's important. I also believe that this past emergency with COVID-19, it was a struggle for everyone. My students, my kids, my children, not the children I drive, but my actual children, uh, 
One of them thrived with distance learning. They got A's and B's. The other one really needs to have in-person schooling. And uh, I think we need uh, to try and give that to everyone, every kind of... I think we need to make sure our kids are happy and learning and making progress. And um, I think we need to change things, not just a little bit, not just catching up, but seismically. I think that while everyone did a really commendable job this past year, I think opportunities were missed. And I think uh, we might want to experiment and try some new things. Not new in the fields of education, but new for this district. Okay, very Thank good. You. Thank you. Elizabeth? Well, hello, everyone. Um, gosh, everyone has such fantastic answers, and I am super impressed. Thank you all. Um, you know, when there's the, this, when I read this question, you know, people ask frequently, why did you run? Um, and my, 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 my thought, my answer is always, well, why not, right? So I, I come from a, um, I'm a mother of four. I have four kids, um, one who's graduated from high school. I have uh, an incoming junior, a fifth grader, and a five-year-old, incoming kindergartner. Um, so we've got the spread, right? Um, the, I was also a student here in Lawrence. Um, I come from a family, a single mom, who struggled, and education uh, was sometimes a secondary thought. Um, I experienced some, had some adverse experiences that challenged my ability to focus and to concentrate on education, um, and yet here I am. So I believe in resilience. I believe in uh, equal representation. Um, I believe that in order to have an accurate voice when de decisions and policy are made, we need um, a diverse group of people sitting on the boards making those decisions, um, and diverse across all spectrums, socioeconomic, race, culture, um, all of the areas. So I'm excited to be here, excited to be part of this incredible group, and look forward to continuing to get to meet all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Travis. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come here and introduce myself to the community. Although I've lived here for 14 years, and apart from a small stint cooking at the Yacht Club, I've spent the majority of the time working across the country. The experiences I gained there gave me invaluable lessons about professionalism, cooperation, communication, and project management, but also left me without some of the deeper roots that you can see up here with these other candidates. The primary arena where I have been involved has been in my kids' schools. I've chaperoned several field trips, I've volunteered as a watchdog, I've contributed to uh, snacks by the cartload, I even did a small fundraiser for some of those teachers for cleaning supplies coming in to the return to full-time schooling. I'm running because I strongly believe in public education. My father was a teacher, my partner is a teacher at Santa Fe Trail Middle School in Olathe. Now more than ever, high quality education is the key to a healthy democracy, a well-informed citizenry coming together to understand what it means to be a citizen of this amazing country of ours will be one of the greatest resources in the next several decades. I'm a parent, I care about my kids, and I care about all kids. That's why I want to contribute to the community as a member of the USD 497 School Board. Thank you. And Miranda. Hello. Thank you for all coming tonight. This means a lot to me. I was uh, very active in the um, events uh, around COVID and, and asking the questions and speaking at the school board meetings, pretty much everyone. So you may have heard my voice before. Uh, I was pushing and I was, will say I was pushing hard and asking a lot of questions. And I will continue to th do that. Um, I, like, I, I think we see some students here, which is awesome. Um, there's so many people that I think have similar questions that, that I have and, and still do, honestly. But I do want to tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, I graduated from University of Kansas. Uh, I'm from Chicago suburbs and um, went back to Chicago. Then, 
after my daughter was born and she was a year and a half, I decided that I wanted to raise her here in Lawrence, Kansas. So I packed up the Honda Accord and put my toddler in the back seat and loaded up the car and, and, and drove, drove to Lawrence because I know this is a amazing community and a community that is, I knew could sp support us, her and I, and that care about each other and are, um, I think, adamant to, to, to build um, great human beings. And that's what I'm here for today. I wanna give our students what they need to shine. And I'm gonna ask questions, I'm gonna ask the tough questions, and I will continue to do that until I feel like there is real progress being made. Not talked about, but actually being made. Thank you for being here again. Very good, thank you candidates for introducing yourselves. Um, as many of you mentioned, this last year has been rather difficult uh, with uh, COVID. And so we're actually gonna start off our first question this evening uh, about COVID protocols. So as we sit here this evening on July 7th, uh, USD 497 has yet to make any final decisions regarding COVID protocols for the 21-22 school year. The Wichita School Board released its protocols in June, giving parents and students notice of the guidelines and the ability to make decisions for their students about the coming school year. There is a school board meeting this coming week, and it is being communicated that USD 497 will give an update regarding their protocols. It is yet to be known if this will be a final decision that families can act upon. If you were on the board next week, what would you recommend and vote for regarding COVID protocols for the coming school year? Would you vote to require students to wear masks? Would you vote to require students to get a COVID vaccination? So please be specific on the yes, no questions. Um, and, and also feel free to, um, like we said, share what you would recommend and vote for regarding COVID protocols. I will remind you that there is a uh, timer in the back for your benefit. And so we will uh, first uh, welcome GR. GR, thank you for being here. And Miranda, we will begin uh, this question with you and then we will work back in this direction. So you have 90 seconds. So no on masks, no on vaccine. I believe they should wash their hands, temperature check, no problem, but that's my firm answer and I don't need 90 seconds, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Travis. The health and safety and welfare of the children and staff is my top priority, and I know the virus is still new, but we've learned a great deal throughout the last year. I don't really expect the board to make any dramatic changes coming at this next meeting. I believe the guidelines that we went through at the end of last semester when we were turned in person school were safe and effective and weren't too strenuous on families. I would feel comfortable sending my two kids back to school under those guidelines. Uh, considering the vaccine, I don't think we have any advisability from the FDA about children under 12, so I don't think we're at that point now. I believe the science should be the leading the decisions that we make. We shouldn't make premature decisions. As a board member, I intend to adapt my voting to the facts and the science and the most up-to-date information. Elizabeth. All right. So you know, this uh, during COVID, I got the opportunity to serve on several um, unified uh, Douglas Can County Unified Command uh, COVID response as an equity impact advisor. So I've gotten to hear a lot of conversations, uh, and that was a huge mouthful, so I apologize in advance. Um, but that, uh, that provided an opportunity to hear a lot of conversation about the pros and cons of masks and how, require and how policy is written. Um, so it's my opinion that we should continue to follow um, the protocols that have been set in place. Um, mask, wearing masks for those who are unvaccinated. Um, we know that, well, I'm running out of time. So yes, continued masks. No, I don't think that we have the ability to require a vaccination. Um, I don't know that there's a lot, enough research and I am clearly not a scientist. So. I will leave the medical recommendations up to the CDC and those who are qualified to make those decisions. 
So to clarify real quickly, you would recommend masks yes. for students that were unvaccinated? Correct. Yes, ma masks for unvaccinated students, no on requirements for vaccine. Okay. Douglas. Um, I believe firmly that if they're of age, if they're 13 or and above and there's a vaccine that is deemed safe for them, they should be vaccinated. I don't. I don't want any kid in that school to go unvaccinated, but until vaccines are safe for everyone, obviously they're not going to get everyone. So my elder child who's in LHS, he's old enough to get vaccinated. I want him vaccinated. I want all of his peers vaccinated. I want state teachers, staff, all everyone vaccinated. For my younger, who's 11, I want masks because until there's a vaccine that's rated for Younger children got to have masks. That's it. Thank you. Nate? Thank you. My uh, short answer is that I would um, uh, vote against requiring students to wear masks, and I would vote against requiring COVID vaccinations. Uh, my longer answer is that um, I am not pro-mask or anti-mask. I am pro-law. And part of the role of the Board of Education is to guide the uh, direction and vision of the district um, within the conf confines of the law. At this time, there are no mandates for us to wear laws, and so I would have a very hard time forcing, that, uh, uh, forcing the requirement of masks on people. As for the uh, vaccinations themselves, um, I am also a registered nurse, and I certainly recommend them my wife and I are uh, vaccinated. However, it was an easier decision for us because neither of us, um, uh, we are not gonna be bearing any more children. We have four already. Um, but uh, I understand the complexity uh, for parents who have to make that decision for their children. And uh, I, I certainly respect and appreciate the decision not to get vaccinated. Um, I would advocate for not requiring it and if it seemed unlikely to be able to do that, I would advocate for the ability to opt out. Either way, I want uh, the, the parents to be able to have that freedom. Thank you. Marcus? I would vote no on mandatory mask wearing and also on vaccinations. Long answer is because I think parents should have the freedom to choose what is best for their own child. That's one thing great about this country is that we know we have our freedoms and we should not have them trampled on by certain things that we're still uncertain about. Um, the protocols that were put in place for our kids to return to school last semester at the end of the school year were great. We should keep those going and if any parent is uncomfortable sending their child to school without a mask, well then by all means, please have a mask. And if you're able to and you think that it's safer for your child to get a vaccination, please do that as well but we should not wave fingers and make people feel bad for not wearing masks or becoming unvaccinated. Kids already go through a lot of things that make them feel insecure, and we don't wanna add that to the laundry list of things that are affecting their mental health as it is. So, no, I will not vote for mandatory masks or vaccinations. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly? Um, so thank you for the opportunity to answer this question. Um, understanding the safety protocols of your child's school is important for all students, staff, and families. It's particularly important this year as we're all entering what is a year that's been rather traumatic. So to see where you're going is important. So I acknowledge the, the waiting that families are doing right now. I appreciate you bringing that up. So I wanted to take an opportunity to say where we are at right now. Um, school will be in person for all students, but virtual learners, that's mandated by the state government, and it'll likely stay that way through the year. There will not be strict social distancing. We cannot achieve that within the required fully in-person environment. Students and staff will not be prohibited from wearing a mask. We have said that as well. So if you have a family member who is autoimmune compromised or otherwise you are not comfortable um, being in the district without a mask on, your child will have the capacity or you as a staff member will have the capacity to wear a mask. So to be clear, um, the school board will likely not vote on the COVID safety 
safety protocols. Dr. Lewis has the authority to set COVID safety protocols in consultation with local and state health officials. It's my understanding that they are waiting for the CDC recommendations, which should be coming within the next couple of weeks. Um, in regard to vaccinations, because they are not uh, FDA approved, um, I would not, we, we don't have the legal authority to require them. I wouldn't vote to require them. And regarding masks, right now we have 70% of our county um, fully vaccinated, which is incredibly exciting and means that we can have least restrictive environments for our learners. So I am absolutely leaning toward not the requirement for masks. Thank you. GR. Uh, first, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Malcolm, for covering for me for question one. Um, I'm going to echo a lot of what Kelly said, so I'll, I'll condense it down. Um, Dr. Lewis and, and district administration continue to work with Unified Command uh, to make sure that when school resumes in, in the fall fully in person, uh, that we're in the best position to provide as safe of a learning environment as we possibly can. Unified Command is currently waiting for recommendations from the CDC, which, as Kelly said, will come out in a, a few weeks. As Kelly also stated, stated there, there will not be a vote on Monday. So to ask how someone who is actually going to sit on that board on Monday is going to vote, to me, is, is an irrelevant question because we're not voting. Uh, the question really is, do we support masking and do we support vaccinations? Uh, currently, the way that Douglas County sits and the way that the school year ended and the way we're, we're sitting, for me personally, personally to directly answer the question, no, I don't support mandatory masking and I don't support mandatory vaccinations. Thank you. Kay. Hi, this is Kay again. Um, and uh, one of the great things about uh, being uh, a school board junkie, uh, watching school board uh, meetings until 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, which is, you know, some of those nerds really love doing that. That's totally me. Um, it, I was like, cool, that's exactly where I thought we were at uh, with that um, decision uh, or not decision on Monday. And I think Marcus brings up a really good point, regardless of um, if you're uh, uh, choosing vaccination or if you're not choosing vaccination um, or if you're wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, please wear a mask, um, that uh, that we shouldn't, we should focus on bringing ourselves together rather than tearing us apart. We've had a lot going on this year that um, in several years that has torn our community apart and we have to focus on getting back together. But in regards to the question, um, so, you know, COVID-19 is like a moving target. Um, the newest strain of Delta variant, which is preliminary support spread, the spread is more rapidly amongst our most vulnerable, uh, which currently are youth under the age of 12. Um, who are not eligible for vaccination. We're looking at being able to have more information on that pretty soon. I have a toddler who, um, as well as a 12 year old. Um, on the stance as to vaccinate or not vaccinate, I follow the science. And like our school district, uh, I consider many data points like spread rate, hospitalization, number of those affected um, in our community to make those decisions. Um, it is one, uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, if you uh, follow the county health department, you would have saw a video of my son saying, uh, um, yeah, time to take a shot. Uh, he was trying to sh tell other 12 year olds what, what that is like. Um, am I still good? No, that, that would be time. Thank and you. that would be time. Uh, so, um, cool. So, that Melissa. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, mandates, yes or no? Ooh, oh, she's done. I, have, I, have, I have more time? Awesome. No, you have time for a yes or a no. Would you? Uh, so, so yeah, so, you know, uh, masking is something that, that you should do unless um, you have not. Would you require um, mask? Would you require vaccination? Yes or no? Well, that is a very interesting question, and I think I answered it with my response. Thank you. No? no? <laughs> yeah, apparently the audience doesn't know. Maybe they can follow up with you afterwards. <laughs> Melissa. I'll be Hello. Um, so just so you know, I do comedy improv, so I'm pretty um, lively, just so you know. I'm not just quirky. This is me. Um, so here's the thing. We've made progress towards moving out of the pandemic, right? But we are not out of the woods completely. So that concerns me. And as Kay mentioned, there is the new Delta variant, which now has Kansas, uh, you know, in a, as a high-risk state. That concerns me. The biggest thing I want is to make sure our staff and our students are safe. That being said, I also respect people who don't want to wear masks, and I respect those who want to wear masks. But I'll be honest with you, if I had to vote today, 
just because of lack of information on my part, I would vote that our students and staff wear masks. Okay, here's the thing. They're uncomfortable, they're hot, they're inconvenient, but so are clothes. But most of us have those on today, and uh, I really appreciate that. I mean, that's really the, I don't like pants, they're uncomfortable, but I still wear them. Um, now, as an educator, I'm also willing to be educated. So if you have a different opinion or you have different statistics than what the CDC is recommending, let me know. I mean, because honestly, 90 seconds, these are all loaded questions that are, require much deeper conversations than what 90 seconds allows you to give. And so I'm willing to have the deeper conversations and I'm willing to learn. You know, email me, call me, me give my number before we leave. I want to hear um, what other people think. As far as vaccinations, I'm vaccinated, I'm for vaccines, but I'm not for forcing people to do things with their bodies they don't want to do regardless, right? You guys, parents need to choose what's right for their families and best for them. And I support that. Even though I support vaccines, I mostly, I more am support of people having choice. Very good. Um, yeah. That's time. Thank you, Melissa. Um, this next question is going to be regarding curriculum. Uh, Kelly, we will be beginning with you and then moving in the direction of, of Marcus and Nate. So, Similar to a company which employs a board of directors to oversee its policy and operational decision makers, every school district has an elected board that sets policies for the schools under its jurisdiction. Their oversight extends to hiring and firing a superintendent, spending voter tax money, and determining what children will and will not be taught. Ideally, this is done with input from the parents. So this question has two parts. Does training teachers in critical race theory and or teaching it to students help close the achievement gaps for minority students, or is it simply a way to try and explain why that achievement gap exists? And then secondly, how would you direct administrators and teachers to shape curriculum beyond reading, writing, and arithmetic to best prepare students for the world we live in today? Thank you for allowing me to start. So as, par as a point of clarification, school boards do not determine what children will or will not be taught. Standards are set by the State Board of Education. School boards do vote on curriculum tools and purchases. As an example, we voted on mystery science, which is the K through five science curriculum and its lessons are standard aligned. We can't just pick any random curriculum. One of the district's strategic plan themes is cohesive curriculum, including the use of evidence-based multicultural instructional resources that honor and preserve students' diverse cultural backgrounds. This theme was developed in part during a 2018 listening and learning tour that heavily involved parents. The board also works to meaningfully include parents into the input of um, it, board committees that inform the curriculum decisions we make, like we involve the district site council, the equity council, the Native American student services, the parents of color advisory committee. Thank you, Kay, for chairing that and serving on the district site council. We likewise utilize building level site councils as advisory um, in their advisory capacity. To the specific question about preparing, uh, preparing students for today's world, teacher led curriculum innovation has been among the most exciting things I've seen on the board. Our Kansas Can Redesign initiatives illustrate that. 90 seconds will not do them justice. Please go to KSBE website to see what the work we're doing and how we're flourishing. Um, so shifting gears here really quickly to CRT framework is not heavily taught in teaching colleges, so there has, there has um, uh, so whether it has an impact on the achievement gap is not something we can answer. If it does have one, I have no seconds left. I'll tell you that if I had any evidence at all that it did, I would absolutely support it because anything we can do in this house of God that would reduce the achievement gap that we have in our school district, we ought to be doing. So be careful, as particularly white people, the emails that I have been getting around CRT have been loaded with racism, so watch this issue carefully. So to clarify, if you found evidence yes. that it was helping with the achievement gap, you would fully support that. It's not that. taught in our schools. It's not taught, it's not taught in our colleges. We have none. No evidence to that. Marcus. Critical race theory. I think this is a very touchy subject, mainly because a lot of people don't know and haven't taken the time to do the research to find out what it really is. 
If there are known achievement gaps for minority students and it is already well known in the teaching community, then why not switch up the approach to what is being taught? I can tell you as a minority student in my day, I don't really recall learning about positive nature things uh, that minorities contributed for our country. I had to learn that away from school and on my own time. The inventor of peanut butter, the person who improved the light bulb, the inventor of the traffic light, and the man even invented the portable refrigerator. I personally had more than my fill of hearing about slavery and the psychological aspects of that. So if not critical race theory, then at least teach more positive things about minorities so they can paint a better picture of their contributions to this country. So it can spark ideas for new achievements. As far as what we're teaching the kids, every child should be taught about credit. What it is and how it controls your life and what you can and can't buy with it. It is a shame to find that out when you go to buy your first car or try to purchase a home. Now maybe some families do teach their children, but I can assure you that not all do. And lastly, I would like to encourage kids who want to own their own businesses, not just go to work for someone else. As a business owner of myself, I can say it's very gratifying. If they are taught only to get a job after high school or college, then teach them at least a trade and allow them to go make money in a field that can support their families. That's my stance on those two questions. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Marcus. Um, Max, if you can move that up to two minutes. Uh, our first two candidates did that, and I think this question obviously is looking like it takes a little longer. So, Nate, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I actually agree strongly with Marcus. I'm going to start with the second question because I think it's simpler to answer. Um, students need to be taught that there are more options than just getting a job after school or college. Um, trade school, apprenticeships, entrepreneurship, uh, community college, all these are not lesser options. Depending on the child, their skills and their goals, um, we need to reinforce the fact that there are other options and it, it may be much better for you to pursue those things. Um, so I, I, I agree with uh, Marcus here on that one. As for critical race theory, um, this is a complex one. Uh, I have some major problems with uh, the, a lot of the philosophical assumptions that critical race theory presents. Um, I think it's unfair to uh, put people in either the camp of the oppressors and the oppressed. And uh, I know as a biracial Filipino American, um, if I was being told that I was part of the oppressed, that I would not be where I am today. I would, I would not be, um, I would have a sense of victimhood, which, which I would make it much more difficult to actually break the chains. Um, if I was told I was oppressor, as I am also half white, um, being told that I'm the bad guy as a child, that's, that's harmful. And uh, what we are talking about here is not just how we're going to deal with society as adults. We're talking about children. We're talking about the next generation of leaders and teaching them these, uh, these either one of these sides is, um, is unfair. So to the exact question, does training teachers in critical race theory and or teaching it to students help close the achievement gaps for minority students, or is it simply a way to try and explain why it exists? Um, I believe that it explains why it exists. There are absolutely uh, objective um, achievement gaps for different minorities. That's undeniable. Very good. Thank you, Nate. Douglas. Yes. Um, I, I agree uh, with our, my two predecessors that we need to teach a curriculum that is practical. That will help uh, our children grow into self-sufficient humans, but that doesn't mean they have to get a four-year degree. It doesn't mean they have to own their own business, but they should have the, the wherewithal to find out how and what they want. And I do believe that a big part of that is training them how to just do their taxes, just balance a checkbook, just fix a grilled cheese. I mean, I would, I would argue for an extended home ec, meaning how to help around the house in more than just taking out the garbage, putting away the dishes. 
I think that there's a holistic means to this, and that's what I would say for the curriculum. And that, the, as they both said, all the opportunities that are available, not just going to a four-year college, not just getting the job, but something that gives them hope and something to believe in. As far as critical race theory goes, I have to say that that term is pretty well bunk to me. Um, it's history. We shouldn't be afraid of history. We shouldn't whitewash history. We should see where we are. Now, I do agree if we're talking about children, we should never do anything to harm our children. But I got to say, if it's confirming uh, suspected beliefs, if I were thinking that, well, due to my economic status or due to my racial status or due to a combination, because they rarely go alone. It's not just if you are Filipino or, or if you're African American. It's also where you made your money or where your parents did. So um, yeah, teach history. Don't whitewash it. You don't need to be putting kids down as oppressors or the oppressed by telling them the truth. Thank you. Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, so I think that there's, you know, to, to be fair, I, th I, think, I think this question about critical race theory is a little bit, um, maybe a bit off the mark since we're not currently teaching critical race theory um, in our classrooms. However, I think that there's, there's something that can be done, you know, when we, you know, when we acknowledge history, when we acknowledge that there was a past, there's space left open for healing and there's space left for growth. Um, the resilience that I talked about earlier is there and is always there, right? So if we're able to teach accurate history, all of the ugly bits as well, and do it in a way that's balanced so that we're also able to educate folks about the accomplishments of minority people within our communities, um, not just, you know, we don't want to just simply focus on the negative aspects, but then the positive contributions of people of color have given to our country. Um, if we can balance that, I think that there's a really positive outcome that we can experience. Um, with regard to, you know, education opportunities and how technical education is a huge area where we can grow. Um, we have the opportunity to change the narrative about what technical education is, what it means, how it's accessed, and encourage our kids to have choice um, in how they receive their education. And maybe we can start doing that at an earlier age. Maybe that's not something that we only start offering in high, high school, but it's something that can be offered in middle school as well. Um, that's kind of, I have a son who is a welder and um, loves what he does. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of him and grateful that the College and Career Center had that opportunity or had that available for him. Very good, thank you. Travis. I think I'm gonna maintain the consensus and continue to agree with the people that have spoken before me, especially Marcus when he specified that research and actually clarifying what critical race theory is, is a very important uh, task we should all take on. History is full of teachable moments. I studied a lot of them when I was at K-State. I have a minor in history, so when it comes to history, I don't feel like anything should be left out. I feel like there's a lot to learn, warts and all. To do otherwise, we might invite repetition of some of the less popular aspects. Um, as far as its application in our district, I uh, heard Kelly say that that's not part of what the school board does, which is understandable and actually kind of negates the question, but 497 is a predominantly white district. 66% identify that way. Uh, the remaining 33% probably don't need uh, reminded about what critical race theory is. Uh, I've followed a lot of the meetings. I've followed a lot of the, I've met Dr. Lewis and I feel like they have already built a foundation of anti-racism into their administration and since they set the policy, I think I'll follow along with them. Uh, the second part of the question is beyond reading, writing, arithmetic, and I think that speaks more to the humanities than it does technical 
um, technical careers. Um, I think that art, science, history, social studies, and our extracurriculars like football are all incredibly important, and that should be uh, focused and emphasized by the school board. That's kind of off topic, but I'm done. Thank you. Miranda? So as far as uh, critical race theory and uh, asking teachers to teach that to our students, if that happens um, to become a bigger conversation, it's in the media a lot right now. Um, I think that's a really big ask of, of our educators. And I think that's really hard. And there's a lot of lenses uh, to um, right, people's experience and what you're bringing to the table. Sometimes that can be a really healthy conversation, but sometimes it just maybe isn't. <laughs> so I, I feel that uh, I do think there's, well, I know there's a conversation there. I just don't know if that's the conversation that we need to bring to our schools necessarily right now, but I do think there is a conversation. And I also um, feel that, you know, what I experienced growing up and what my seven-year-old daughter is experiencing is very different. And um, like a few others have, have said, I don't want to place uh, any biases upon her, and I want her to go through life looking for people that are going to treat her well, and, and invite everyone into our home and, and really have a, um, a healthy experience. And, and that's what we do. We, we, it's awesome to watch her, um, especially compared to how, how I grew up. And, and I'm not saying everyone has that, but um, it, I think it's a different conversation. And I, I think it's great to ask students what their experiences are and what they need because we don't always have the answers. And so when we're just adding things to people's plates because we think it's what they need, let's ask them what they really need. And as far as what else we can do, um, as far as education, I, I, I believe in goals and learning what it takes to actually achieve them, breaking them down, timelines, um, executive functioning skills. I, neurodiversity is really important part of my uh, experience with my daughter and what we go through. And, and this is, to me, the conversation and, and what we need to, to really um, raise healthy-minded um, children into adults that are fully capable of, of achieving what they, they want. And that hits some mental health issues as well, because the, the more you can do for yourself, it feels good. So I think there is a big gap right there in, in that aspect of their lives. OK, thank you. Melissa. So first, I think it's important that before we start, we even approach anybody about a question on critical race theory, that we understand what it is. And I think a lot of Americans don't understand what it is. Second, I want to tell you that if we're going to teach history in schools, we need to tell the truth. Why wouldn't we want to tell the truth? And history is backed up by historical events that are documented. Tell the truth. We all want the truth, so let's tell the truth. But also, the understanding of CRT in this question isn't completely accurate. Um, what we need to do, which is kind of a portion of CRT, is really educate ourselves on implicit bias, right? So this moves us away from, is this racist? Is this not racist? And it pushes us towards the understanding of different forms of racism. So in understanding that, then in our schools, we can recognize the different types of racism and help us to better implement things like restorative practices. So we're not doing a punitive discipline, right? We're making differences. So um, it shows us, uh, hang on, I lost my train. Restorative practices, um, it helps us move toward our actual social justice goals, which, you know, that's about distributing resources fairly, treating all students equitably. I mean, that way they feel safe and secure. And I can't imagine anybody who wouldn't want our children to feel safe and secure, any of them. Um, second, uh, our educators have been doing this a long time as far as um, teaching and preparing our students for today, right? Um, the pandemic inspired teachers to reimagine how we educate our children. We encourage students to participate in deciding how they learn best so they get a say in their education. Students began teaching students. Um, during the election, elementary students learned how the democratic process of electing um, a leader worked. They had to actually research the candidates, and then our district did a mock um, vote 
you know, so the ele election, so they were able to vote and see how that worked out. Um, in Free State High School, one of our teachers for our spe special education student, they set up a grocery store simulation so they can learn social skills, right? And they practice checking out the food and job skills. So we are already doing that. Um, as aside from talking about the vocational aspects of what we can and can't do, KU is a regent school, so they actually have a lot of say on what our district has the opportunity um, to offer our students vocationally. Okay. Um, so it's not really the district's choice. We have to approve what we're offering through KU. They get a say. Thank you. Kay? Hello again. Uh, so I'm going to start like Nate on the second question when it comes to, you know, how do we direct our administrators and teachers to shape our curriculum? I think it kind of gets to encouraging um, and supporting our administrators and teachers and creating opportunities and pathways for our students. Um, it's one of these things that, you know, being um, um, helping with vocational rehabilitation service, um, helping individuals with disabilities um, find employment and pathways uh, of careers uh, for five years, you get to kind of learn a lot about uh, what that transitional, those transitional, transitional service looks like in um, secondary um, education. So um, I think that's one of the things that we can be supporting our teachers and our administrators on um, is helping, uh, helping them um, support students and advocating their choice by individualized learning plans. Um, looking at starting that um, in middle school um, versus waiting until students are in high school. On the second part, when it comes to critical race theory, um, like Kelly, I, I don't believe that there is enough, um, there, there really is enough um, research to support that it's, it's helping the achievement gap or not helping the achievement gap. What there is, um, research on is being able to have a caring adult in our classes in our schools. What there is support on is what happens when teachers or staff have livable wages, um, have access to health care, and so they're not stressed when they're going into the classrooms. And so for me, um, you know, there's that conversation about how do we make our classrooms and our schools more equitable, but how do we start with making sure that we're taking care of our students and our staff? And so that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. GR. Um, I was going to start the, the same way that Kelly did uh, by clarifying that the, that the board doesn't um, determine curriculum. We set policy. Um, we also don't directly train our staff in CRT and we don't teach it to our students. Um, but what we do do is we help our staff by encouraging them to examine and understand the inequities that exist in our minority and marginalized students and where those inequities come from. Because they do exist and they have to come from somewhere. But they don't just exist around race. Male students are more likely to face discipline than female students, for example. So we need to have an understanding of where in the system those inequities come from. And if, if we're going to create a system here in USD 497 that works to do away with them. And CRT is just one theory that we can use to e examine where those, where those inequities come from. But it's only one. As for the second part of your question, within our strategic plan, we have processes and policies that help us frame our teaching in a culturally sustainable lens. We want to know where students come from, what makes them tick, what makes them comfortable. We want them to come into classrooms and ask questions. We want to give them the voice and power over their own education. We want to teach them to be self-advocates before they move out into the world and to decide for themselves what secondary path is best for them, and that's how we prepare them for the future. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the next question, and it deals with the role of parental authority in raising and educating children. So schools play an important part, uh, important role in the lives of children. Parents and families play a much more significant role in their academic and social success. Given that parents and educators must work together for a well-rounded student, this next question addresses how you, as a potential school board member, view the role of parents in being the primary determining voice in several critical areas. School districts across the country are adopting policies regarding comprehensive sex education, social emotional learning, healthcare diagnosis or treatment, including gender identity and transition issues, reproductive and mental health issues, requirements around vaccinations, and the use of pronouns in classrooms. Do you believe that schools 
should be required to receive parental consent prior to addressing these areas with students. And I recognize that the list there <laughs> is large. <laughs> um, but do you believe that schools should be required to receive parental consent prior to addressing these areas with students? Will you protect parents' rights to be determinative of their children's education in these areas? And please explain your rationale. And we will begin with you, Douglas, on this question. Thank you. Um, I drive a school bus, as I said, and I gotta tell you, I don't have any bad kids. I have some messed up kids, but I, all the kids are good as far as I'm concerned. Parents, they're a little disappointing. Um, speaking as a parent myself, I've lot of, let a lot of things fall through the gaps. I figure when one of my children is successful, it's not really because of me, it's because of them. They did it. I was only there to make sure they had food, to hug them when they were hurt, to help them sleep, to remind them to brush their teeth. As far as what happens in schools, the question is, do you want to be part of public society? If you want to be part of public society, send your kids to a public school. That's fine, but I don't think you should have to make sure that every little checklist is made. Well, do I want my children to know about healthcare diagnoses? Do I want them to learn about comprehensive sex but not about gender identity? You choose to send your kid to a public school, then you are giving the okay that this public school is going to do the best that they can for, their, for all the children there and for the society that these, that these children will form. I consider the same thing along with uh, wearing masks and vaccinations. You choose to live in a society? Well, make that choice. Make sure everyone's safe, the workers, the older kids, the younger kids. My 15-year-old has asthma. His mother has asthma. I feel very strongly that science must rule. Medical society, that's what we should be caring about. Very good. That's Thank it. you. And we are a minute and a half back now on this question, so that's okay. Elizabeth. Thank you. You know, I think, uh, of course, it's always a parent's um, choice in how their own children are educated. Absolutely. Um, if there are questions about particular areas that a, a parent, particular areas that might be sensitive to, to a family or to an individual, then sure, we can... I, don't think it's too difficult to offer some notification um, and to have that dialogue between the educator and the, and the parent. Um, and ultimately, the parent can choose how you want to parent your child and how your child receives education. I don't think that that can be carried over to something simple like pronoun, use of pronouns in the classroom. Um, that doesn't, that then starts to bleed into are you making the decision on how other people's children are being taught? Um, I don't support that piece, but I do support parents' ability to make decisions about how they, their children are educated with regard to the other issues within this question. Very good, thank you. Travis. Um, a bit unfortunate to answer this question before the working members of the board is sort of they have enlightened us as to some of the true workings and the limitations that the board has on subjects such as this. But um, from when I'm looking at my kids and thinking about, uh, I do remember having opt-out options during sex ed, so I think that's already part of the system. But if the broader question is can, parent, can school supersede parents, I, don't, I think parents are always given the option to build on what school teaches their kids. If they disagree, they're able to hash that out over dinner, for example. School's never gonna take away a parent's right to parent their kids or to choose what their kids are. Well, they're gonna be exposed to some things, but I guess that's just life. That is part of life. And that flows into pronouns and gender fluidity are part of my children's lives even beyond school that has that's not something that can be they can be insulated from I don't think that's part of the board's purview very good Miranda yeah. 
So a few pieces uh, to this answer, and uh, one would be that I feel that the work that I did, um, I was also on the COVID committee, um, and there in the work that I did around um, getting the kids or asking the questions, getting the kids back to school, I was meeting with board members and met with Dr. Lewis, I met with the superintendent, um, at the time and worked uh, inspecting schools, looking at the square footage and the health and safety. And I will tell you the entire time as hoping to be a parent that could really add value to um, the school board, the school as a whole. I do change management work for companies. I, I help with this process, large organizations. So we had a lot to give and there was other team uh, that was part of this team that we were really there to support the school and we really felt excluded. So that is a piece that I, I feel parents need to be partners with the school and, and we need to um, make sure that our kids and our parents and the community is really represented. Um, the other I just uh, need to share that my seven year old, when I ask her to brush uh, her teeth, she says, my body, my choice. So apparently something uh, got through to her. So I'm not sure. Uh, how to, where to go with that. All I could say is filling out a form did not really prepare me for that one. So I feel like maybe we can um, do more than filling out a form when there's that conversation that's being um, addressed at school and help uh, parents better educate parents. That's, I think parents really need more, especially pronouns and, and where things are going. Our, our kids are experiencing something different. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Melissa. This is a tough question. Actually, I mean, it's, it's not. Um, I support parents and their rights to, you know, raise their children. Absolutely. I would never, ever want to go against a parent. I support that as I say this. You have a choice where your children go to school. If you want a faith-based education, you're not going to get it at public school, and you shouldn't get it at public school because not everyone's faith is the same. And I see people shaking your heads, and as we sit here in church, I also want to remind you that Jesus Christ, none of his actions were popular, and they crucified him for it, and I appreciate that. I love him for that, and I'm happy that he went against the grain, right? But we respect parents in our schools. You have every right to question the curriculum and say, hey, what are we teaching our kids? What are we telling them? Of course you have every right. But as parents, we don't have a right to set the curriculum. Our our board members, our, our school board, they don't set curriculum, they set policy. So no, parents don't get the right to set curriculum. You know, our, edu our, you know, our administrators do that, our teams do that. So yeah, I respect your right as a parent. I was a parent, you know? I raised amazing children into adulthood, and I love them, and they are great humans, but I didn't always agree with what they were taught, you know? But at the same time, it's my responsibility at home. If you're afraid your kids are picking things up at school, Maybe what you're teaching them at home isn't sticking. And I'm not saying, I'm not blaming you, but I'm saying that was always a thought in my mind too, right? If I don't trust them to go to school, you know, you put them in our hands to trust, to trust us. You know, if you want a faith-based education, send them to a Christian school. I'm not saying take your kids out of public school, it's awful, it sucks. It's not. It's a great place. And I will respect students, and I will respect their pronouns because I'm in the buildings with them, and I need to build relationships with them because I'm someone who can help them. The suicide rate for our teenagers who are struggling with gender identity is so high. Would you want your child who might be struggling with gender identity to kill themselves? Because they're not going to come to you if they don't feel safe talking to you about it because you know because you disagree I'm not saying I agree you know with you know pronouns it's hard for me because I you know was in school for many years where they you know taught grammar it is challenging but I am right. going to respect them because I love them and I want to be someone that they trust and can confide in so That's that time. way if they do have a thought of suicide I can reach out to you as a parent and say hey hey this is trouble this is a risk how do we help you fix it thank you Okay. Bless her. I, I love your passion. Uh, sure. uh, it's, it's really, really fun sitting next to her. Um, so, I, I mean, the reason I ran uh, for school board, or am running, not ran, it's not past tense, I'm still running. We're not done yet. This is the first one. It is. Um, it's because of opportunity, access, and choice. And so, for me, um, I'm going to protect the rights, the, the choice of parents. 
I mean, as, as simple as, as can be. Um, and I, I just think about like, you know, for families who don't, who don't have options. I'm sorry, I don't have money to send my kid to private school. I'm sorry, I don't have time to fill out the scholarship. So we have to be able to provide those opportunities for families to exercise their choice in our public schools. And so I, I think that something like, you know, opting in or opting out it, it is a good way to go. Um, I think that's the question, yeah? Yes, thank you. GR. All of those items are important and can, on an individual student basis, be vital to their well-being and feelings of being seen, heard, and loved. All necessary pieces for a student to want to be present and participating in their own educational experience. In the end, the vast majority of our students are minors, and as such, parental consent is a key component, and that consent needs to be respected. Thank you. Kelly? I think I broke it, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll say that in my own parenting, I have exercised choice and there are, have been occasions when I have, at, even as board president said, this isn't a good fit for my family or my kid and I've asked and opt out of certain, certain things that have come up within the school district. So I certainly support parents' choice. And having read this question, I, this is gentle, I don't know who drafted it, but I'm guessing I don't want to send my kid to the, sec, the same sex education class that whoever wrote this question wants to send their kid to. Um, so I'm going to say it, it's, it's a long list, and I wish I had 90 seconds for each one of the things that was listed. So I just want to make a couple quick points. Um, I agree parent involvement is, a, uh, is critical to student success. As a social worker, I'm acknowledging that not all parents are created equal. Some are painfully, horrifically abusive. And unfortunately, grown-ups don't always respond to their LGBTQ children in a manner that is safe. Our transgender and non-binary youth policy and our equity policy celebrates LGBTQ students' personhood and contributions to our community. It protects their dignity and allows students to self-direct around gender. That doesn't mean we preclude parents from conversations about gender identity, but it does mean that we have to have procedures and protocols in place that protect the student when or if we do and that student-centered work that's that student-centered work that approach is being a human that is decent and that's the way that I hope that the grown-ups in our district interact with our students thank you Marcus yes I believe if nothing else the parents should be kept informed of what their child is learning at school not all parents are involved in the children's education like we might hope but they should still be informed by the school what the kid is learning. I do protect the rights of parents to raise their own kids the way they see fit. And I absolutely protect their right to give consent about teaching their child about topics that might be deemed controversial to them. Parents have different backgrounds and beliefs and may not be adamant that their child learns such sensitive issues from the school. They want to explain it to the child in their own way, in their own time. So if we're going to advocate for anyone, we're going to advocate for the people who see the child most times of the day, on the weekends, holidays, and et cetera. So if a curriculum is seen as, you know, not what they're ready for in their mind, let that parent make that decision. So in summation, parents, parents, parents. Thank you. Thank you. Nate? Parents, parents, parents. I, uh, I, I will, um, I do believe that uh, schools should be required, excuse me, um, schools should be required to re, uh, give parent, receive parental consent prior to addressing these areas with students. Um, I would uh, protect parents' rights to be determinative, determinative of their children's education in these areas. Um, I, I think that it's, reasonable to expect uh, that parents give their consent for field trips, um, things like that. I mean, th these, are, these are important topics and uh, I think it's reasonable to expect parental consent for these things as well. Very good. Thank you, Nate. All right, we're going to move on to the next question. Um, and as you have received them and knowing what we have time-wise, we're going to give 60 seconds for this next one but I am gonna kind of shorten the question a little bit 
um, towards the end so you know what to focus on. Uh, so per pupil spending for the next school year is set to be over $16,000. This amount is a record high and continues to increase each year, and that's per pupil. According to the Kansas Department of Education, ACT scores have decreased for the previous five years running. While education has social benefits and isn't completely a capitalistic sum game, voters do want to know that their investment is providing its greatest benefit. Since more funding doesn't necessarily equate to better outcomes, where would you steer current resources to produce a better education for each student? That one we're gonna scrap, okay? We're going with the second one here. What specific areas do you see where board members and administrators need to be more accountable for the resources uh, that have been provided? So where are those resources that you see that you wish within the current confines, hey, I wish we could put more money in this area as maybe opposed to another area? And we'll begin with you this time, Travis. I figured you'd pick me since I made eye contact. <laughs> Hey, you should have learned in grade school. You don't do that. So. I, I did. Um, well, I can honestly say that I believe there's never enough money in public education. There could be, well, there could just be a lot more. I realize that we're in a current situation is a little bit more of a budget crisis, but where it would be spent most effectively is something that is a very insider question. I don't I guess I don't have a specific answer to that, I'm afraid. I just think that Board members are responsible for supporting teachers and making sure they have the tools that they need in order to be the best they can be and be, make the best decisions for their kids. Um, yeah, just make sure the budget reflects the priorities of what's best for the children, what's best for the staff. Okay, Miranda. So speaking to my experience in the last year, the year prior, kindergarten, first grade, um, personally, uh, with my child, there was, uh, and still is, massive uh, disconnect between areas of struggle and um, what to do next. So I feel there's a real need to, if it's bringing in additional staff, and, and find a way to support these kids in the struggle. But it's, what is the struggle? And it's different for everyone. And um, giving and providing resources, and resources that are Actually, if you know if, if a test score is, is at this point, or a GPA, or um, you know we know this child is a goal for athletics and they're they're behind, how do we make sure that that we're moving these kids forward? And I, I haven't seen that, and I've I promise you I've sent letters and I have reached out, and really it was like crickets. So. I'm in the middle of a struggle right now with my child, but I've heard more and more and more of the same story, especially um, after last year. So I will say, um, I wanna hear your story. So please reach out to me. It's really important to figure out how to move forward from this. Okay. Thank you. And Melissa, all that money can't go to the cheer squad. Come on! Where, where would you wanna see it go? Man, we could have some really fancy <laughs> shoes. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, I want to ask you to please don't measure our students' success on ATC scores, right? ACT scores, that measures how well someone did on the ACT. It does not tell you how successful they are or going to be, right? That bottom line. Also, as this question was being asked, I saw a gentleman mumble that there's too much money in education. So please email me or call me and explain that to me because there's not enough money in public education. And I know that because I'm in the buildings. I'm in the buildings. I sit with the kids. I sit with the staff. I know where we need money. But I also know and feel that our district doesn't always spend its money wisely. We don't have enough money to pay our educators a livable wage. Educators can go next door to any surrounding districts and make more money, significantly more. We have public, we have classified staff, a large number, that are on public assistance. We should be ashamed of ourselves because we get 54% of the tax dollars, taxpayers' money. So why aren't we spending it wisely? We have empty buildings that are sitting empty that we are paying utilities on that we're not doing any educating in, right? One of them had a water leak that we didn't know about, and we walked in, it was a flood, it caused a huge utility bill. 
What, what are we doing with our money? Stop creating top paying administrative positions and use that money to put right directly into our schools and pay our educators better because they deserve it. Thank you. Okay. All right. How do I come up with that? Okay. No, I don't. So yes, I agree. Um, uh, increase pay wages. Um, more money for the school district would be great. Um, but so we know we have a budget deficit. We also know we have a customer service issue. Um, families are leaving, teachers are leaving, not coming back. Um, and it, it kind of gets down to, okay, why, why are we keep looking outside of our community opposed to looking in? We have lots of different partnerships here in uh, Lawrence that we can be building upon. Uh, of course, the University of Kansas with the Jayhawk Blueprint. We have Haskell next door. We have plenty of uh, educated people here in Lawrence with grant writing skills, um, being able to focus our attention on being able to put some resources and someone that can um, secure funding, because uh, there are lots of different grant opportunities out there that our school is not um, focusing our attention on. Um, so yeah, so I, I really kind of think that um, in order to prioritize and appropriate funds, uh, we have to kind of focus on the customer service issues that we're dealing with here in the school district and focus on developing out those partnerships that are right here in our front yard. Thanks. Thank you. GR? Um, you know, I, I would I would say the same thing about trying to link uh, positive educational outcomes to ACT score is 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 kind of it doesn't make a lot of sense because the phrase positive educational outcomes is not something that's really defined. Um, is it ACT score? Is it graduation rate? Is it two years post secondary success? Is it all of those things combined? Uh, one of the really great things is that um, we've chosen to monitor all of those statistics and more and to report report on them frequently as part of our strategic plan. Also built into the strategic plan is we formed, we reformed the budget and program evaluation team to provide accountability that directly addresses your question. Um, that team provides updates and suggestions to the board um, and they did so this last year about changes to implement um, and specifically the boundary um, committee also suggested changes that were very helpful to us in terms of trying to, to figure out how to best direct those resources um, as we try to implement the strategic plan and move forward. Thank you. Kelly? So I just came from a negotiations meeting with the um, para-educators, and I disagree with this question's premise and find, that it, <laughs> find it that it's misleading at best. Hey, Melissa. We're going to allow Kelly to answer the question just like you did. Thank you. Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to allow Kelly to answer the question. Okay. Um, I can actually understand the, the passion behind that and why there's frustration. So we are working to look at how do we dedicate resources in a way that helps us retain the educators that we have, and that includes paraeducators. Not it's, 3% rate, that's not what it is. It's, it's Melissa, that's the last time. Thank you. you want me to leave? If you do it again, yes, I would prefer that. Thank you. Truth. And with anything, we should tell the truth. We're going to give everybody the opportunity to answer the question. I, they are not So, as a as a point of as as a point of clarity, I actually agree that we are underpaying para educators and teachers. So, I also have been in school buildings, and I've also worked directly with children. And I certainly agree that there is more that we need to do in this area. So, I do believe directing resources in that way is important. I also want to point out that we need to, we have a teacher shortage, so it's also important that we are looking at how do we support our staff there. I like to see how do we, when I'm looking at how we dedicate resources, the question I ask myself is, is this in the best interest of the student? Is this in the best interest of the teacher? Is it in the best interest of the district? What can we do with our money that we can get the most gain out of it from our teachers because it is so limited? Um, recently, we won a um, court case after a 10-year battle in Kansas, um, the Gannon ruling through the 2019 State Supreme Court um, 
passed that uh, ruling, and it brought us up to 2008 level fundings. That's 13 years ago. So when someone's frustrated at the board, and they should be, we need that more money from Topeka than what we have um, to be able to do the kind of work that we want to do to reduce class sizes, to increase the kind of programming we want to see for all okay. students. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus? Uh, all my answers have been scripted. I'll go off script on this one. Um, yes, we, we should pay, you know, teachers a livable wage. Everyone should be able to go to a school where the teacher is confident for what they're teaching. They're uh, preparing students for success later in life. And they should also reflect that success as they stand in front of the classroom. I personally have not been in any classroom since my children graduated from Free State uh, back in 2018, but um, from the passion that I'm hearing on this panel right here, it must be something that's really a big gap. Um, yeah, it has to be hard to stand in front of kids and you know, teach them about success and you don't feel you have success yourself. And uh, so I hope if there is a chance for the board or uh, Board of Education to address this topic and kind of close the gap of, you know, what wages are earned, and then that would be sufficient. Once again, I had a written statement, and I just went off topic. Great. And you'll have an opportunity to provide those to people as well later. Nate? Thank you. Um, as, a, as a business owner who's um, come out of the uh, uh, pandemic here and has seen the um, uh, the difficulty in hiring um, employees, I also uh, can understand, at least to an extent, this, this same discussion. Um, we do pay our employees a, a livable wage at my business, and we figured out a way to, to do that in a financially sustainable way. There may, be, there may be other options we haven't looked at. I mean, you know, you guys have done extensive work. I respect it. But um, there may be some creative ways to approach this um, to pay teachers a living wage as well. Um, I also believe that we've touched on some of the things I believe we should spend money on. Um, earlier in the discussion tonight, um, the uh, technical training, the, uh, as, um, as Douglas said here, the uh, uh, extensive home ec, really love that. Um, I learned how to write a check in high school, and that was an extremely important thing that I learned. And uh, we need to pass those kinds of things on, just how to, how to put together a budget, how to, uh, you know, how to just understand the market and go after the things that um, are important uh, in the marketplace. Um, That's time. <laughs> Sorry, Nate. I had one more thing. All right. Douglas. Um, where the money goes, people are more important than facilities. Um, smaller classes, that's where the money should go. More teachers per student, per group of students. I think, uh, I think facilities are important to be clean, healthy, and well-appointed, but if you're spending so much money renovating and then you're not spending money on the teachers, the staff, the paras, I'm, I'm strongly pro-union and I think everyone deserves a living wage. But I also think that everyone needs something to believe in. And if you can't offer teachers and paras a living wage now, then you should be working on, one should be working on providing the promise of health care, retirement, and a living wage in the near future. and something we should be working towards. As far as transparency goes, yeah, I think more could be communicated to parents from our administrators. That's all I got. Very good. Elizabeth? Thank you. Um, you know, I think that if there was, you know, money is always the question, right? Where does the money go? How do we spend it? I think that we could do a, I, you know, if, if I had to choose, I, you know, if we could do a much better job um, advocating and supporting our kids living in the margins. 
So our kids who, you know, how do we provide better supports for kids who are currently in foster care, kids who are in group home placements, um, kids who are incarcerated, homeless, uh, how do we provide better supports for those kids? Um, and how do, I, how do we prioritize those kids um, who deeply, deeply deserve that advocacy? Um, speaking on to that advocacy and who is supporting, who is providing that support now, and that's our paraeducators. Our paraeducators are touch the lives of some of our most vulnerable youth, um, and the work that they do is so impactful. Um, if we're able to pay them better, we're able to continue to see further success and supportive of kids who really need our support and need our. Thank you. So as we close up this evening, I'm gonna tie in uh, probably what you see is number six and seven, so the issue on transparency along with your closing statements. So we'll give 90 seconds for each of those. Um, the current school board is considering moving to once a month public meetings instead of twice a month. Uh, on its face, this would seem to lead to less transparency and opportunity for public comment. So would you vote for the school board to meet only once a month? And you can just give a yes or no on that, possibly a brief explanation, and then use the rest of the time uh, to share with us your final message to the voters. Uh, and so before we begin with UGR, I just wanna say thank you all uh, for your time. Thank you for your dedication to public service and even attempting to want to serve in this role. Uh, many people don't do that, but you have, and we greatly appreciate it. So, GR, we'll begin with you. Um, I would vote to go once a month. I certainly un understand on the surface and how that would look to decrease transparency. Um, in my in my in my role in 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 IT and in, in hospital I, IT, I'm a data guy, and 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 the data just doesn't back up that concern on the surface, especially this year. Just just looking at this year, for all the board meetings in 2021, um, the vast majority, we've had four or fewer patron com patron commenters. We've had one that was double digits. Um, uh, we've had two that were five, one had zero, and we had a couple that were two or three. Um, moving to once a month uh, would, um, I don't know that it would significantly, it would not significantly re reduce the opportunity for public comment. Um, mainly because the vast majority of the people um, interact with us either via email or in what Kelly and I lovingly refer to as grocery store conversations because people just stop us in the grocery store and talk to us then and we invite them to come and make public comment and they usually turn us down. Um, and, and, and which is which is true. They're like, I'm not going to a board meeting, but I'll talk to you and Dylan's. Um, uh, so uh, so f for me, I, I don't think that that's an issue. Um, as for a, a closing statement, um, you know, the, the last year on the board has been difficult, and I don't want it to overshadow the other three that I've done, but it really can't not. Um, you know, based on the information that was presented to us at any given time, we also had, we often had to make decisions that we knew would make people angry or, or would significantly disrupt people's lives. Every decision that we made, we thought was in the best interest and represented the community to the best of our ability. Over the last four years, and specifically the last year, I'm proud of the accomplishments that we've done, and I'm proud uh, of the work that I've done, specifically around facilities, negotiations, and curriculum improvements, and I would be honored to serve for four more years. Thank you. Kelly? Okay, so along with uh, GR, I'm actually voting on this in a few days. Um, I initially thought that the, the district administrators came to us and asked us about reducing the number of meetings we do. There are most most districts in the in the state only do one meeting a month. It's statutorily mandated that way. And then districts that are larger, like um, Lawrence and um, Manhattan, Ogden, and a few others, there's a mixed bag. Some do twice a month, some do once a month. But the the proposal actually um, isn't once a month. It's once a month and some when needed. Um, so initially I was for it because I like to support our district administrators when they make those requests and to preserve their time so that their time is spent serving our children and not, you know, not 
giving reports to the board that maybe aren't exactly what we monitor or need to be monitoring. However, I've heard some feedback from my board colleagues like Carol Kledu Blackwood and um, Paula Smith, and we heard some information from the LEA that maybe they're concerned about the number of meetings. I think it's valid the way this question was meeting. So the short answer is I need to do more research. I'm going into Monday's meeting with an open mind. This is how I make all of my decisions. I'm sure it's maddening, um, but I promise to be very thorough in how I do it and to listen to more constituents to hear, like, is that a real concern that I need to consider before I vote on it? Um, so this is not surprising to me that GR knows exactly how he's going to vote, and I don't. But that's that. So I'm going to not. I'm not going to give an answer right quite yet. Um, now my closing statements. Um, I think I have just a, a few seconds. I want to extend my great gratitude to each of you for running. This has been a crazy time, and the fact that there are so many of you willing to do this after watching what we went through is really exciting to me. This is an an, an awesome group of folks that really care about our kids, and so thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm really excited about the direction Lawrence is going now. We have this inspiration to renew this commitment to public education. We now understand how important it is, and I trust you to vote for the right people for right now. I'm extremely proud to have served for the last four years, and I absolutely will support whoever it is that you um, elect, and I will be there to support them even if it is not me. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Marcus. Uh, the topic of meeting once a month, um, it could give more time to gather accurate data to report. And if I'm getting information from GR, it would also give people more chance to show up to the meetings and not feeling they have to be there every second or fourth Tuesday. Uh, I'll spend the next few minutes talking about myself, one minute I should say. Uh, your vote is important. Your rights as a voter should be utilized. Put the best candidates in position to help the kids of this community, all of the kids. If you have heard some people up here speaking what you might perceive as jargon or double talk, then that could mean that they are more concerned about sounding smart or intelligent than doing what is best for the kids of this community. I don't have it in me to offer my opinion or beliefs at these meetings. I want to make every decision based on research and data. This next school year is going to be a doozy, very crucial year for the mental health of students families, and the faculty as a whole. Hopefully everyone is happy to get the things back to normal. And hopefully you voters don't mind a few changes as well, starting with electing some new school board members such as myself. Thank you so much for your time and attention tonight. And if I didn't say so and you can't read the card in front of me, I am Marcus Logan. <laughs> Thank you. Nate. Thank you, I agree with um with GR and Marcus uh, on the issue of uh, meeting once a month. Um, it seems like uh, they have explained it well. I'd like to spend most of my time on my final message um, because rather than being, you know, mostly a request to vote for me, I, I wanted to um, just charge everybody with the understanding that we, we, have, to, we have to reach for unity We've got, unfortunately, we live in a time when the media and very loud voices are telling us that it's us versus them, that it's red versus white, Republican versus Democrat, and this is a nonpartisan election. But we have a legacy to live up to in Kansas. We are the free state, and going back to the Civil War, we were on the side which prioritized unity in our nation against those who would divide us, and against those who would secede. We also, as a state, have, in my opinion, the greatest state motto, at Aspra per Astra, excuse me, at Astra per Aspra, to the stars through perseverance. And if you can get behind me, I will do everything I can to help these students, our future leaders, our children, as they go to the stars. Thank you. Douglas. Um, uh, regarding meetings being once or twice a month, I, I, uh, I would think it's safer to have twice a month, but if the consensus and the data bears out that once a month is fine, then who am I to say? Maybe put it on a one plus a month, just, to, just in case of extenuating circumstances like a COVID outbreak. Um, but. Uh, as far as my message goes, why 
what is my final message? Why vote for me? Um, I want to voice possibilities of change. I want things to be different. I think our society is a little bit too hard on ourselves and our kids bear a lot of that brunt. And I think we should be looking to keep our kids as happy and safe as possible and stretch for, for things that they let their reach, let their, um, let their reach go beyond their grasp. You know, kids are smarter than we think. Kids actually know what's going on. Um, just help them navigate the pain that the world offers us and maybe have school all year round, maybe have late start for adolescence. I think that there are things we could do to make life better for the kids, work for the workers. People have to work all day while their kids go to school and for uh, the teachers and paras and support staff. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth? Thanks. Um, so with voting, uh, with meeting, once a month, I yes, um, the so understanding that board members also typically where this is a volunteer position, um, so a lot of times folks also have full time jobs, um, so it could allow for some flexibility for for members. Um, you know, I I want one of the things that I think is uh, that I want to make sure you know for my closing for closing statements, I think that. First off, I want to express gratitude for each person who's on this panel. Um, it's doing, stepping out into a public forum is scary. Um, it's a very foreign feeling and an incredibly publicly vulnerable position to put yourselves in. So thank you for being willing to step into that arena with me. Um, also, I want to acknowledge that Called to Greatness um, has done amazing work within this community. Um, and the connection that you have made with our most vulnerable youth um, does not go unnoticed. Thank you for the work that you continue to do and that you have done uh, for our community members. Um, some of those kids I've personally gotten to meet and gotten to engage with, and it's, it's really beautiful what you do. Um, and I look forward to continuing to push um, for the prioritization of those kids living in the margins and make sure that they have the resources uh, that we can provide. Thank you. Travis. Uh, the first question about school boards, I'm gonna sit back and kind of listen to what GR and Kelly said. Um, I don't necessarily believe it's about transparency as much as convenience for them and that the science bears it out. Um, it's hard to have an informed opinion when I'm not on the board yet. Um, for the closing message, I first would like to extend my thanks to Morningstar Church and Call to Greatness for hosting this forum. It's been a great opportunity. Um, I may lack the inspirational scope of some of my panel mates up here, but I'm, last thing I'd like to leave you with is I'm ready to do the work. I'm ready to read the books. I'm ready to study the reports. I'm ready to sit in the long meetings, whether it be two, four hour or one, eight hour, if Matt's right. Um, I'm pretty good at getting yelled at, so I'm ready to get that out of the way, too. And I'm ready to be here for the students, staff, and parents of USD 497. Thank you. Miranda? Uh, concerning the once a month uh, meetings, I feel that if there is more time to possibly get uh, become more active within the community or in the, um, the schools and go to events, and be a part of students' lives, I think that would be a great use of time. Um, but I will say that as a parent that spoke at um, many, many uh, meetings, I don't necessarily think parents' voices were heard. And maybe that's why they didn't continue to call and, and, and spend time in that space. That was heart-wrenching to go through, I will tell you that. <laughs> But um, I hope that in future parents will, will, will speak out. We must speak out for our kids. Um, and I will say that I have a heavy heart up here. And uh, 
I know there's a, a massive divide. In six, in six weeks, I really feel concerned about our students walking into those buildings and the energy that they're going to receive. And I feel that it's, it's, it's going to take some work and some effort to get uh, um, us in a place where that we're all working in the same direction. And my concerns right now as a parent, not even as I'm pushing forward for this, this seat, but is really, are we asking the right questions? How are we gonna ensure that, that they're, they're gonna have the support that they need? So I'd say continue to ask questions and put yourself out there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa? As to the school board meeting um, once or twice, they absolutely need to meet twice. Uh, we have jobs. We know when we, we run for school board, what it means we know that there's going to be meetings we also know the amount of work it is for free and we choose to do that because well i want to help and i i just love if you can't tell i'm passionate for education um you know we might disagree on topics but i'm always willing to listen and be educated because we have to be willing to have those conversations and change and i'm one of those people so if you see me in dylan's and i'm a school board member feel free to talk to me because i have no problem with that um, for example, with the school board meeting twice, we don't get enough done in two school board meetings. How are we going to get it done in one? For example, a biology teacher at Free State High School spent her own time to write a grant to plant some plants around the Free State High School area, and they are sitting there dying because they're waiting for the school board to come and approve the structure. So she spent all this time, and she has the money, but it's sitting there dying, and she can't get anything done. So also, as far as, I'm going to use the rest of my time to tell you that our educators do need to be paid more. Our classified staff does need to be paid more. Our, our, our board says we want them to be paid more, but they don't make any movement into doing so. Anna Stubblefield left our district. She made $187,000 a year. What did we do with the money? We made a top-paying administrative position that pays $133,000. Dave Ramsey tells me, if I can't pay my bills, don't open a new line of credit. Thank you. Kay. Um, so it's late, right? 848. <laughs> um, and uh, I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight as I round us out. Um, I, for me, um, by the time that a family member or a school board member, no, school teacher or whomever goes to commentary, um, they have reached a boiling point by the time they get there. Um, and we hear the overflow there. Taking action now, just in your roles and helping out um, as uh, I think, um, uh, I can't, Trevor down there had talked about with the snacks, um, as he can, helping out with, uh, um, in the classroom, talking to your principals, talking to your students. It, you don't have to, it, leadership is, an activity, it's not a position. And, and I, I, one of the things I just think that we need to just make sure that we're doing, um, regardless of if you're on school board, if you're not, is pay attention, be engaged, um, because you're involved in this process. The problem with our, our school district is everyone's problem, and it's gonna take us all to, to fix it and make progress on it. So I wanna thank you all for coming out tonight, and thank you all for having us, and have a good night. Thank you. All right, so thank you very much. Let's give our candidates a hand. I know that many of you may have more questions uh, on the handout we gave you this evening. Their email addresses are listed. Uh, and, and I know that there are, are things that they would want to talk to you about and uh, want to answer your questions. So uh, please feel free to email them, ask those questions. Uh, reminder that the primary election is Tuesday, August 3rd, and we really hope that tonight was helpful uh, for all of you as voters in determining uh, the direction we'll go forward here at, uh, in Lawrence with USD 497. So thank you again and have a wonderful night.